You're watching Cape Media News, brought to you by Cape Media Center. Tonight on Cape Media News, psychedelics on the ballot. Plus, Janice's special election. And an exciting week in sports. These stories and more are coming up next on Cape Media News. Good evening and welcome to Cape Media News, your source for hyperlocal news that matters. I'm Jamie Horton. And I'm Maxie Davidson. Now just one month away from the November general election, we're continuing our series taking a closer look at the state's ballot questions. Last week, we dove into ballot question five, which aims to eliminate the tipped minimum wage. This week, we're looking into ballot question four, the legalization and regulation of psychedelic substances. News director Mitch Sock has more. Next month, Massachusetts voters will face a major decision. Should natural psychedelics like psilocybin mushrooms be decriminalized and regulated for adult use? This could be a groundbreaking shift in how the state handles these substances, and ballot question four is at the center of the debate. If passed, ballot question four would decriminalize the possession, use, and cultivation of certain natural psychedelics for adults aged 21 and older. This means that people could legally possess and even grow specific psychedelics, like psilocybin mushrooms, for personal use without facing criminal charges. But it doesn't stop there. The initiative also proposes creating a regulated market for these substances, similar to how cannabis is already handled in the state. This would involve licensed centers where psychedelics could be sold and used in therapeutic settings. A Natural Psychedelic Substances Commission would oversee the industry, making sure activities like cultivation, distribution, and therapeutic use are all regulated. The initiative is built around public health and safety with a focus on harm reduction. It even includes provisions for supervised psychedelic therapy in licensed centers for conditions like PTSD, depression, and anxiety. A 15% excise tax on sales would generate revenue for the state, with cities and towns having the option to add up to 2% more. Also, the measure acknowledges the traditional and indigenous use of psychedelics, seeking to protect the cultural significance of these practices. There are also equity provisions to ensure access to these services for low-income individuals, veterans, and minority communities with reduced fees and financial support available. However, not everyone is on board. The Coalition for Safe Communities raises concerns about public safety and the potential for misuse. The first thing I want to say out the gate is that this is not, from our opposition side, this is not a war on drugs sort of stance. We are not opposed to the idea of using psilocybin to help people who it actually helps. The problem with the ballot question is actually the literal ballot question. The ballot question is written that where it says basically that um, there are going to be two parts to it, and the two parts are contradictory. The first part is that we are going to have um, it decriminalized where there are going to be these centers that people can go to and they can pay. So this is going to be a for-profit situation where they can pay to have a licensed facilitator, which is not a medical professional, but a licensed facilitator, take them through a trip. But then the second part of the ballot question says, and also you as a private citizen can grow mushrooms in your home, unregulated, in a 12 by 12 foot room. So do you see how these two things are contradictory? On the one hand, you're saying you need to have a licensed facilitator or a location and you need someone to drive you home. And on the other hand, you're saying, but actually you can also do this in your house freely. And 12 by 12 feet is a lot of space. To grow mushrooms. So what do you think? Should Massachusetts move forward with decriminalizing and regulating natural psychedelics, or does this initiative pose too many risks? The Healy Driscoll administration has officially stopped the construction of the multi-purpose machine gun range on Joint Base Cape Cod. The machine gun range, set to reside in the Upper Cape Water Supply Reserve, was strongly opposed by multiple governing bodies on Cape. After multiple organizations, including the Barnstable County Board of Commissioners, called on Healy to halt the project, the administration said that the Healy Driscoll administration is committed to protecting the environment and the quality of life of Cape Cod residents. 
Governor Healy did not approve the signing of the contract for the development of the multi-purpose machine gun range at Joint Base Cape Cod because the funding has not been reauthorized and the project was still undergoing review. Commissioner Mark Forrest lauded Governor Healy's action in this matter, restating the importance of protecting drinking water supplies. The Barnstable County Board of Regional Commissioners has sent a letter to Secretary Buttigieg of the United States Department of Transportation expressing their strong support for federal funding to replace the Cape Cod Canal bridges. While the Sagamore project is now fully funded, funding for the Bourne Bridge replacement is being sought from the Multimodel Project Discretionary Grant and the Bridge Investment Program. While the exact sum of the requested grants is unknown, the combined amount is believed to be over $1 billion. Dennis Memorial Library is hosting a motherless daughter support group on the first Monday of each month from 6 to 7 p.m. Whether you lost your mother yesterday or many years ago, this group is a place to share struggles, questions, triumphs, advice, and comfort with those who understand. The next meeting will be October 7th. It's flu season, Chatham. Take advantage of the town's drive through vaccination clinic for Chatham residents on October 9th from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. at the Public Works facility on Kroll Road. Vaccinations for COVID-19 and the flu will be available. Barnstable's drive through clinics will be available on October 16th from 1 to 3 p.m. and November 6th from 9 to 11 a.m. at St. George Greek Orthodox Church in Centerville. For only $3, protect yourself and your loved ones from the flu this year. It's time for another round of household hazardous waste collections. Tomorrow, from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m., Yarmouth residents can head to the Yarmouth Senior Center to dispose of items too toxic for the trash. Things like gasoline, oil-based paint, solvents, adhesives, pesticides, and more will be accepted. Next Saturday the 12th, Harwich and Chatham residents can bring their hazardous materials to the Harwich Transfer Station. The Family Table Collaborative has resumed their prepared meal distribution at the Hyannis Youth and Community Center. Any Cape Codders who need a free, healthy, delicious meal for yourself or your family are invited to contact the Family Table Collaborative ahead of their meal distribution dates. Their goal is to distribute meals on the first and third Thursdays of each month with the deadline to sign up on the Tuesday before distribution. Check out their Facebook page for updates. The Town of Yarmouth has been awarded over $35,000 to improve road safety. The funding comes from the Municipal Road Safety Grant, the State Agency Traffic Safety Grant, and the Underserved Communities Traffic Safety Grant. These programs utilize federal funding awarded by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. They aim to address road safety concerns through a collaborative effort of prevention, enforcement, education, and outreach. Beginning mid-October through November, the Town of Barnstable Water Department will be flushing all water mains to improve water quality. Look out for yellow signs indicating that system-wide flushing has begun and white signs indicating active flushing areas. Flushing will take place between the hours of 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. with rare exceptions. If you'd like a complimentary call in advance of water main flushing in your area, call the Water Department office at 508-362-6489, extension 101. Coming up after the break, an important article in Dennis's special election. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Cape Media News. This Tuesday, October 8th, the town of Dennis will hold a special election asking residents to pass a Proposition 2.5 debt exclusion for the Phase 1 wastewater implementation plan. At a special town meeting earlier this week, residents unanimously voted to approve the ballot question. Select Board Chair Christopher Lambden explained in detail the importance of passing the article and approving the funding. Why do we need to implement wastewater? Well, besides the fact that the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection is mandating it, because the water we drink is below us. The water we swim in is all around us. The food that we eat swims in our waters. Our main revenue stream, tourism, depends on our fresh and clean waters. To me, the most important reason why we should vote yes to wastewater is our next generation. We want to leave our environment cleaner and better for them. Dennis has been working on the wastewater project for decades and needs a yes vote on construction borrowing to retain its state funding eligibility.
Town officials say that approval will mean a cost savings of more than $100 million for Dennis taxpayers. Whole Foods is opening its new location in the former Cape Town Plaza. Located in the plaza, now known as the Landing at Hyannis, the 790 Iano Road store will be larger than the current Whole Foods and a bit more modern. Opening day will be on October 10th, and the first 300 customers get a tote bag and a coupon with offers up to $100. Hyannis Main Street Business Improvement District has announced their newest event, Restaurant Week. The first annual Restaurant Week will be October 18th through the 25th. Local eateries will have the opportunity to try out new dishes, showcase their menus, and offer an elevated experience during the off-season. For a list of participating restaurants and their menus, visit hyenasrestaurantweek.com. The Atlantic White Shark Conservancy has several special events this month. Head to the Shark Center in Chatham tomorrow for their Jossum Fossil Day. Enjoy story time, an introduction of fossils with a paleontologist, and a fossil excavation demo. Next Saturday, the 12th, the Gills Club will have its October meeting, highlighting the study of paleobiology. Explore the timeline and evolution of sharks with scientist Dr. Lisa Whitenack. And towards the end of the month, join the Shark Center for their Halloween festivities. On Thursday, the 24th, learn about spooky white sharks like Skellington and Casper, then carve or paint a shark-themed pumpkin to take home. Trick or treat on Friday, the 25th from 4 to 8 p.m., or Saturday the 26th from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Head to AtlanticWhiteShark.org to register for any of these spooky events. Harwich Port Merchants and the Harwich Port Cultural District present Pirates in the Port. Saturday, October 12th, from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., head to Main Street and Cross Street for a day of family fun, including games, face painting, artisan's market, food, drink, and live pirates. Is your tween or teen interested in tabletop role-playing? South Yarmouth Library will host a Dungeons & Dragons one-shot adventure on Students Half Day on October 24th. At 2 p.m., enjoy some snacks and roll some dice while you travel into fantastical lands. Bring your own level five character or play as a pre-made character in the single-day mission appropriate for kids aged 12 and up. Yarmouth Recreation presents their Halloween Spooktacular event. Saturday the 26th at the Mattakees Middle School, come enjoy hallway trick-or-treating, games, face painting, costumes, and a spooky movie. This free event will be from 5 to 8 p.m. and registration is required. Head to yarmouth.activityreg.com for more information. The Chatham Chamber Merchants Association invites you to their much-anticipated Oktoberfest celebrated in downtown Chatham. On October 19th, head to Kate Gould Park and the Town Hall parking lot for a day of festive fun, live music, beer, and family-friendly activities in the heart of Chatham. Gates will open at 11 a.m., and the event kicks off with a kids' costume parade. But don't worry, the beer tent opens at 11.30. This event is free, but donations will be accepted and put towards future events. And lastly, this evening, we send it to Ryan Downs with a recap of This Week in Sports. Welcome back to the Cape Media News Sports segment. I'm your host and local sports guy, Ryan Downs. On Tuesday morning around 4 a.m., the MIAA released their first power rankings of the fall season. We'll give you a closer look to see where each of our schools line up in their respective sport and division. Starting off with football. Football is a little different than the other sports. There are eight divisions as opposed to five like the rest of the fall sports. Only the top 16 teams from each division will move on to the postseason, so long as they have at least three wins within seven games played. We had our eyes on Barnstable and DY all season so far, and they have not disappointed. Barnstable stands at 4-0 in the eighth seed in Division II, while DY has a 3-1 record and was ranked 14th in Division VI. And the two schools actually play each other in a few minutes when they kick off at 6 p.m. at DY. Aside from it being a rivalry game, it's been built up to be the battle for the best team on Cape and has been circled on each team's schedule since August. So get down there and check it out if you can. For boys soccer and the rest of the sports, they all follow the same format for postseason qualifications. The top 32 teams from each division will qualify regardless of record. And teams ranked 33rd and lower will qualify for postseason play-in game 
so long as they have a record of 500 or better. At the beginning of the season, we highlighted and said we are going to keep a close watch on Monomoy and Nosset's boys soccer programs. Monomoy was the runner up in the state championship game last year and is pushing hard to get back there and finish the job. Nosset has declined its role as the perennial powerhouse on Cape over the past couple years, but they still have the foundation to get them where they want to go. Currently, Monomoy is ranked 18th in Division 4, with a 5-3-1 record at the start of the week. Nosset is undefeated and sits at the 19th seed in Division 3, with a 7-0-2 record. And our surprise team of the category has to be DY. They are currently ranked 28th in Division 3, with a 5-1-3 record. Moving on to girls soccer. Girls soccer on Cape is a little lackluster comparatively, but there's still good competition to be had. We only had Nosset Girls Soccer on our preseason watch list in the category, but I've expanded it to include Monomoy's program as well. Both Monomoy and Nosset made it to the round of 32 last year before being bounced. Both teams look to approve upon last year's early postseason exits, as Monomoy is currently ranked 15th in Division 4 with a 6-3-0 record, and Nosset is ranked 21st in Division 3 with a 4-1-2 record. Now on to field hockey. We had two teams on Cape last year make it far in the postseason for field hockey. DY made it all the way to the quarterfinals last year before being bounced by the eventual state champs. And Monomoy lost in the state championship. Both teams still have that fire in their eyes and are loading up to make another run. DY is currently the fourth ranked seed in division three with a six, two and two record while Monomoy is the number two seed in Division 4 with a 9-0-1 record. Lastly, but certainly not least, we have volleyball. You can't talk about volleyball on Cape, let alone Massachusetts, without mentioning Barnstable. Barnstable has the most state championships in the sport, with a total of 18 titles. They haven't won it since 2016, but forced the championship game last year into five sets played before losing 3-2. This year, they are picking up where they left off in dominant fashion. They are the eighth ranked team in Division I currently with a record of nine and two. And DY has to be the dark horse program on Cape. In the last decade, they're consistently making deep runs, but have yet to claim a state title. Right now, they sit as the 10th seed in Division Three with an eight and three record. These two programs also collided this past week on Wednesday as DY hosted the Red Hawks we were only able to catch one and a half sets of the game as it was delayed due to fire alarms going off. But it was an unbelievable level of competition, going back and forth as each point really meant something. Barnstable claimed the first two sets with scores of 25 to 19. And DY made an all out push to avoid being swept in the third set by taking it all the way to a 33 to 31 finish. But DY exhausted themselves trying to keep up because Barnesville came back in the fourth set and slammed the door on them, as the final set resulted in a 25 to nine score and Barnesville winning three to one. That's it for this week's sports update. Back to you, Jamie and Maxie. Thanks, Ryan. I know many of us haven't even set out our jack-o'-lanterns yet, but tickets for Yarmouth's cookie stroll on December 14th are already on sale. Mm -hmm. It's never too early to start looking forward to the holiday season. Tickets for the annual stroll are $25 and proceeds benefit the South Yarmouth Library Association. Thank you for joining us this evening. If you have a story you'd like to see covered, please send us an email at newstip at capemedia.org. Tune in every week for more hyper-local news that matters on Channel 26, Apple TV, Roku, and Fire TV. Be sure to follow us on all of our social media, including Facebook, YouTube, and TikTok. For Cape Media News, I'm Jamie Horton. And I'm Maxie Davidson.